good evening. There is a time to speak, and also there is a time to refrain from speaking. In this lesson, we will now explore eight times we should remember to stay silent. I say remember because these are not new types of things we will be talking about. We will be considering eight good times to be silent. These are not things in our discussion tonight that you don't know. It's not like I'm going to provide some sort of new novel information that you couldn't figure out just in the world in which we live in. Yet, these eight things are good reminders of what to do and why we should remain silent in various circumstances. The first time that would be good to stay silent is when your judgment is clouded. I will provide scriptures with each one of these topics, but we'll first go to the old proverb writer, the words of Augur, the son of Jacob, his utterance, this man declared it to Ithiel, and then from Ithiel to Ukal, in Proverbs chapter 30. Some people in the scholarly realms believe this was Solomon and there was some sort of other name for it. I don't know why they say that when they've given like all these different names of people and none of them seem to indicate Solomon. Uh, even when Solomon was given his other name of Jedediah, that's not mentioned in this list either. So I think this is the words of Augur, the son of Jacob, uh, not David, but the son of Augur, that this man declared to Ithiel, and then Ithiel and Ukel. I think these were proverbs of other wise men that other understood other pieces of information. And when you look at what was written, it says various things that they wrote. When you skip down to chapter 31, you find the words of King Lemuel, the utterance which his mother taught them. Some people attribute that to Solomon, but it says Lemuel as well. If you look at Proverbs 31 and Proverbs 30, you find pieces of wisdom or when are good times to recognize judgment. When you see the judgment that people make, uh, he says, let's just focus right now on chapter 31. He says at the beginning of 31, I just want to focus on one verse in verse 4 and 5. He says, It's not for kings, O Lemuel, not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes intoxicating drink. Because if they're going to drink wine and get drunk, they're going to forsake the law or forget what the law even is and twist the just, justice system so much that, that, that it wouldn't make any good decrees if they're the king making the rulings. He says, Give strong drink to those that are perishing. He says, give wine to those who are bitter of heart because they're perishing. Let them drink and forget their poverty or their frail frame and remember their misery no more. Proverbs 31 says it's not for kings to give strong drink to themselves. If someone is a king and someone is a ruler of a nation, they should have if they're the king and they're the ruler or president or vice president, they should have sobriety or seriousness. Proverbs 30 says it, 1 says it's not good to give strong drink to a king. If someone is dying, well, one receives potent morphine, right? There's some sort of strengthening thing to keep them alive. As the proverb writer teaches us, strong drink is for the sufferer in that particular instance that would be given to one to keep them alive at that time. They may have had a different type of medicinal use in the ancient times than we do today, but we don't give, we don't give kings morphine. We give people that are passing away or in great pain, those types of things. Uh, kings need a level head to make decisions. And lots of things could cloud our judgment. And so it's not good to speak when our judgment is clouded. There are many things that cloud our judgment in the world in which we live in, 
alcohol and drugs cloud people's judgment frequently in the society in which we live in. Uh, but there are other things. Anxiety could cloud your judgment. Anger could cloud your judgment. Oh, being tired could cloud your judgment. How many times have you been tired and someone says, what did you say? You say, well, I really meant this. And the second thing you said is just as funny as the first thing you said because they're totally off. And the person goes, go take a nap. And once a person takes a nap, they wake back up, they're a little more level-headed. Sometimes tiredness clouds judgment. Or someone who's angry, they really didn't mean what they said fully. They were just grumpy, so they said something they shouldn't say. So whenever your judgment is clouded, it's not a good time to speak a lot. If your judgment is clouded, it's a good time to, uh, to not speak at all. Colossians chapter 3 gives another instance. It says in Colossians chapter 3 uh, about our seasoning of our language and the way it should be. Let's turn to Colossians 3 and look at a very familiar text to many, but let's talk about it with a little bit more depth. In Colossians chapter 3, uh, it says, in, uh, you know, we, we often talk about the verse that, that talks about, uh, let your speech be with grace, seasoned with salt, so that you know how to answer each one, and that's there. But look at this chapter 3, verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ... Seek those things which are above. If we're going to talk to people, and yes, our language should be seasoned with salt and grace so that we can impart hearing uh, good messages to others, but if we do that, we need to recognize we've been raised with Christ. We've been lifted up with Christ, and the seeking of the things which we seek are things from above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. So our mind, as well as our mouth and our speech, should be set. It should be set not on earthly things, for we died and our life is hidden with Christ in God. But when Christ, who is our life, appears, then we will appear with Him in, in, in the glory. He says, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. He said, you used to walk in these things, but now he's saying, seek those things which are above. If our words would ever be hurtful, they wouldn't be, if our words are, if we're choosing to use hurtful words, that's not paralleling the things that are from above. We need grace plus salt. That doesn't mean grace plus unpalatable things, but grace and palatable things. People need to become thirsty for Jesus when they hear our words, and they're not going to become thirsty for Jesus when they hear our words. If we're, if we're calloused in our communication, people aren't going to be longing for Jesus. But uplifting phrases and Bible redirection, it's not supposed to cause others to devalue Christian faith. When we are striving to evangelize to other people and teach the gospel message, we need to try to increase with our words those things that are kind and nice and wonderful and that uplift others and show that we are focused on the one that was raised, Christ Jesus. Because He was raised, we need to seek our, our, our words to be heavenly words and things that are from above. And so we're familiar with Colossians where it talks about the idea of uh, let your speech be with grace seasoned with salt. But uh, I, I go back to Lanny's invitation that he gave a long time ago. That was a really good invitation. Salt's supposed to make things taste good. You know, when you, when you put salt into something, it gives something seasoning. And the person goes, well, I want another piece of that. And then what do they do? They get a glass of water because it had some salt in it, and they go eat some more. Well, we want people thirsty for Jesus. We want people to long after what, what we're trying to give them in a palatable way that they like so that they see Jesus is good, not bad. Dare we ever speak in such a way that is so hurtful for others that they say, Oh Lord, please save me from your followers. We don't want that to happen, but it happens in the world. People see hypocrisy. They see things that we do based on what we say or how we present evangelism things to them. And they think, well, they're just being caustic or mean or hurtful. If our words are ever constructed in such a way to design our words to be hurtful, don't say anything. That's a time to be silent. 
If we want to say something hurtful with our words, stop and remember Jesus didn't even do it at the cross. He said no hurtful words on the cross. Something to remember. Third, if our words are going to be recognized as words that really aren't useful or are bordering on deteriorating types of things, uh, but really just not useful, there's no reason to say anything. Uh, we're, we're people of habit. We like to speak because we're used to speaking. But the scriptures say, let no corrupt speech come forth from your mouth, but only what is useful for edification. We studied Ephesians 4.29 this morning, and that was a great uh, study this morning that we had in RD's class. We're just piggybacking off that tonight. Uh, the idea uh, here is he says, he doesn't say, okay, sometimes you can be corrupt and corrosive with your speech. Sometimes you can be deteriorating. Sometimes it doesn't have to be useful, but most of the time it does. He says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. You're only supposed to speak what's good for the necessary edification that it might impart grace to the hearers. If you don't, you're going to make God sad. Where does it say that? And do not grieve the Holy Spirit from which we're sealed for the day of promise. It's the very next verse. If we have useful speech, it makes God happy. If we have deteriorating or corrupt or speech that isn't useful, it grieves the Holy Spirit of God. The words of the wise, Solomon teaches, not Lemuel or Augur or Jacob or Uthiel, but Solomon did say also to parallel some of the, the speeches of the other wise ancients. He says, the words of the wise are like goads, which go down and strengthen us and prod us to do right. Words of like goads, you know, like a cattle goad or a cattle prod. Go, go, get going, cattle. But then he says in another place, for the words of the wise are like honey, sweeter than honey, that drip like honeycomb. Someone says, well, is Solomon being contradictory to what he's saying? No, he's saying some things help and increase their usefulness if they build up. I'll use an illustration from this afternoon. Rachel made some spearmint tea. I don't know what all was in it. Some sort of echinacea, spearmint, lemongrass. Jesse, I don't know if it had lemon in it. It might have had lemon. But it had all sorts of stuff in there, and I can talk a little better than I could this morning. <laughs> My throat's a little bit stronger. So I said, after not talking for a while, I'd like another cup of that tea. So I made another cup of that tea and got through. Well, what's my point? Like a goad, it had something in there that's pricking my throat to be able to speak better. But I also put a little sweetener in there, something like honey, so that it would be palatable to drink. So what's the point? The point is our words are the same way. If there's no value to our words, let us consider learning the framework of the scriptures that relate to the discussion points that we're not quite yet enriched with. If you're saying, well, I know a lot of times I, I say things and then I regret what I say, and I'm like, well, how do I get to become useful with my speech? We need to look at the scriptures and learn how to be enriched with the discussion points of the scriptures. For example, let's take the illustration we just used. Critical words and negative thoughts expressed are generally very rare things that need to be spoken. Sometimes there does need to be a critical thing spoken. Uh, sometimes there does ha have that need for something negative to be stated. But look at two Proverbs from Proverbs. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Okay, hold that thought in your mind. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. That's a proverb. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. But then in another passage it says, But a friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for uh, solace during adversity. Although friends may offer a rebuttal or a constructive criticism, negativity is actually a habit that is very avoided by the wise because disciples of the Savior know Christ's words were useful and encouraging and not pointless and deteriorating. That's pretty important, brethren. So when our words are recognized as useful, say them. If it's not anything useful, don't say it. 
Here's another il interesting illustration from the scriptures. When our opinion doesn't matter, just be silent. If our opinion doesn't matter, don't argue. Don't, just, just let it be what it is. Moses. I can't, Lord, I, I can't speak. I don't have the gift of gab. Well, Aaron, your brother knows how to speak. Uh, um, uh, what if they say, uh, go to the burning bush passage. What if, in Exodus, what if they say, um, uh, I have no authority to do this. Uh, okay, cast down your staff. Okay, so what am I supposed to do with this? He throws it down, the snake comes up. Whoa, oh, pick it up by the tail. Okay, I'll obey you. Picks up the snake. Um, uh, but what if, and you hear this, he starts making excuses and opinions that don't really matter because God's chosen him. God knows he's going to use Moses to lead the people out of Egypt. His opinions don't matter. If God selected him to do that, he's going to do that. And so the next statement is something like this. He says, what if they don't believe me and don't know who you are or where you come from? He just turns the tables on the Lord. He tries to tell God that his opinion, Moses' opinion, matters above God's opinion of himself. And he says, almost sarcastically but yet seriously, he says, well, you tell him the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sent you. You tell him I am who I am, and the great I am sent you. And you go there and do that. And he coalesces and agrees to follow the Lord's pattern. And he goes and he leads the people out of Egypt. But why does he do it? Because he's convinced by all these things of God? No, because God knew his heart and knew he would do it anyways. Moses shows throughout his lifetime so many acts of humility. Just strike me instead, Lord. Don't harm the people. Uh, blot out my name, not the people that are whining, 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 over and over. But God tells him, your opinion doesn't matter, Moses. My opinion matters, and my consideration on what I want done matters. So when our opinion doesn't matter, it's really no time to talk. But sometimes others will devalue our speaking. Jesus gives an illustration of a time someone devalued his speaking, and yet at the same time he could help someone who was in sin. The passage of Scripture on the board is John 8, 8, uh, when there's a lady who's caught in adultery, and the Pharisees uh, were on the scene, real quick to judge, real quick to make uh, a death sentence out of it, which it very well could have been. Uh, it could have had that, uh, uh, that sentence based on Levitical law, although they couldn't do it in this instance because they didn't have the other fellow who was involved. So since they didn't have both, it was uh, illegal to slay one. But Jesus didn't get into all that. Jesus didn't start talking when the others would devalue his speaking. He stooped down on the ground. Look at verse 8. He had told them, well, regarding them, he says, when they wanted to, to stone the lady and kill her, uh, he says, well, he who is without sin, why don't you pick up the rock first and throw it at her first? If any of you are without sin for what you've done, you pick up a rock and throw it at her first. If you're without sin, and from the oldest to the youngest, each one just sets down their rock and walks off. So what does Jesus do, though, in the heat of the, them picking on him? Well, he just stoops down on the ground and starts, who knows, doodling. He just starts drawing in the sand. They were trying to test him, saying the woman was caught in the very act. They said Moses commanded that she should be stoned. He says, what do you say? They tested him so that they could find some way of accusing him and entrapping him. But verse 6 says, Jesus stooped down and wrote in the ground with his finger as though he didn't hear, just kind of ignoring them. When the others would devalue his speaking, silence was the best answer for someone who didn't value his words. Jesus and the Pharisees were at odds, and he knew that if he started giving a big, long explanation, they wouldn't value it anyways. So when the woman in adultery was left there, he had to get to her and tell her what her sin was, 
and tell her it was wrong, but he had to get them out of the way first before he could address a meaningful conversation with the sinner. And so in order for her to value his words, he had to get rid of those that didn't value what was true. Number six, another good time to be silent is when you don't have enough details or evidence. There are a lot of times that God simply has given no revelation on something. Uh, we often quote from Deuteronomy where it says, For the secret things belong to God, but those things which have been revealed belong to us and our generations forever. We know that verse. We quote that verse. But as often as we quote that one from Deuteronomy, uh, do we also quote Deuteronomy 4.2 from the beginning of the book, where in Deuteronomy chapter 4, in verse 2, it says, You shall not add to the word which I command you. Okay, when we don't have enough details or evidence to, to say God wants us to do something, we better not go beyond what He said. So He says, don't add to the word which I command you, nor take away from it. We say, well, God stated what's wrong about adultery. God stated what's wrong about uh, all sorts of things. And some people say, well, uh, it, that was for that culture, or that was for that era, or th that only applied to them. Many of the things which he states apply to all of us. And he says here in the second verse, he says, Keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Revelation 22, 18, another familiar verse to us towards the uh, conclusion of the entirety of the Bible. In Revelation 22, 18, if you want to turn there, we can read that one as well. You're familiar with this verse. You'll know it when you hear it. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if you add to these things, anyone, God will add to him the plagues that are written in the book. Well, that sounds terrible. I mean, any one of those plagues would be really bad, but to add to them all the plagues from the book would be just terrible. So we need to recognize that if we don't have enough details or evidence to add things to God's Word, then we need to be silent about God's Word and respect His silence. I'll give one example. A presiding bishop over all churches. Someone says, well, the Bible doesn't say not to. There's no real passage of Scripture that says not to. Uh, elders are over one local flock. And the reason there is not centralized denomination archbishop, denominational archbishops, is become, because there's no revelation of God giving enough evidence to give that detail to tell us to do that. And so when we don't have enough details or evidence, we don't just start constructing some sort of theory based upon a numerous number of spurious passages that aren't supposed to be linked in a way to create some doctrine. That's called false doctrine. That's what Peter says when he says many people take Paul's words and twist them or rest the more difficult of the Scriptures, the ones that the mature would easily understand, but those who are immature wouldn't get. And so they say they twist those words to their own futility and lead others astray in false doctrine. There's no presiding bishop over all the churches. Well, don't tell a Catholic that. They believe the Pope is the presiding bishop over the entire realm of every church in Roman Catholicism. And so we must recognize that when we don't have enough details or evidence to speak, we should be silent. That's a biblical point. Here's another one that is probably not discussed as much, but it makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, I, I mean, this next one makes a lot of sense. If you turn to 1 Kings 12 and 16, that's 1 Kings 12, 16, we've got a situation where there's a revolt uh, against Rehoboam, 1 Kings 12 and 16. And the king didn't listen to the people, and the, king ans the, the people answered the king, saying, What share have we in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To you, your tent, go to your tents, O Israel. Now see to your own house, O David. So Israel departed to their tents. 
This phrase, go to your tents or depart from your tents, is not only mentioned in the time of the revolt against Rehoboam, when Rehoboam and Jeroboam were at odds, nor is it only given after the death of Solomon. It's used in various places throughout the Kings and the Chronicles to talk about times when the people were asked not to speak. Sometimes people that were leaders amid the people had basically said, we're the leaders and this is not a time for you to revolt against us. It's a time to go home and not make a mob. How many times in our society today could we use some of the wisdom of the ancient Israelites to say, if you're really upset about things and you're really thinking of being caustic and fighting or starting mob violence or going against the police force or going against some, uh, uh, I don't know, something you're protesting against that gets out of hand and you form some sort of coalition of other people and you get upset and you yell at people and use bad words or do just basically just mob violence. We see it all around us in the world in which we live in. How much better would it be if they really didn't have, uh, uh, if they really were asked, don't speak, just to say, go to your tents, go back to your homes. This isn't a point for you to be speaking. This is an instance of that, and it's not the, the sweetest instance of it in Scripture. We find more of the sweeter or kinder instances of the go to the tents passage from men like Samuel, who would say often, to your tents, O Israel. David used the phrase, to your tents, O Israel. He has spoken, he's made a decision, he was the king. Now go home, pray about it, think about it, but don't cause a riot. Our nation could use a lot of that today, a lot of it. When asked not to speak, don't speak. If it's not your place to speak, don't speak. The phrase to your tents, O Israel, should be a given. But if somebody actually, who's a leader, asks you, please be silent, adhere to that. Make an understanding that I'll be silent if asked not to speak. 1 Kings 12, 16, it's not the only instance of that in the Scripture, and I'm sure you good Bible students understand that. Many of you have been studying the Scriptures for many years, and you understand the phrase, go to your tents, is used in a lot of different circumstances and places in the Bible. But we're simply saying eight times to say, stay silent. One would be when your judgment is clouded. Another would be if your words would be hurtful. A third would be if your words are recognized as not useful. A fourth, when your opinion really doesn't matter. A fifth, when you... Uh, if others are going to devalue your speaking, like John 8, 8, and Jesus and the Pharisees with the woman in adultery, verse number, the sixth one, when you don't have enough details and ask not to speak. And then finally, when you don't have something to actually impactfully say to someone. Now, this is maybe something that we struggle with the most. You might say, well, I'm not really the type of person to say mean stuff or non-useful things to people or hurtful things. And if I know it's not my place to speak, I don't get up and start yelling at people or getting upset. I get that, but how many times do we say something that's just not impactful and thinking, well, i got to say something. I don't know what to say, so I'm going to say something. I've, I've just got to say it. Just thinking I've got to say something about something that is discussed doesn't mean you should add filler talk when you're not really going to add relevance to the conversation. This is the idea of impactfulness. Mark 9, 5-6 is a classic example of this, and we're going to use this as our concluding scripture for the night. But in Mark 9, 6, Peter and James and John are up on the top of a mountain, and, and Jesus is with them, and He's transfigured before them, and He sees... Moses and Elijah. So he sees some sort of form wherein one from the grave and one from heaven were before him. He sees Jesus, Moses from the grave, and then Elijah from heaven, but they're in some sort of transfigured form before him on a mountain. And Peter's thinking about all this, and he, he says, I got to say something. This is really amazing. He doesn't just say, this is amazing. He goes, in his mind, you know this is what his mind says because the text reveals it. He says, let's build three tabernacles. Jesus, let's build three of them. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And a voice calls out from heaven that is the heavenly voice and says, for this is my beloved son in whom I will. Please listen to him. You need to listen to Jesus. And then they disappear and Jesus is left with them. 
But it says why he said it because of that last thing. He was giving filler talk. It actually says he was giving filler talk. It says it in the sixth and fifth verse when it says, it was what he said because he didn't know what to say. He just didn't know what to say, so he picked something to say. We do that all the time. We don't know what to say, so we think, I just got to say something. There's an old story. I don't know how old it is, but I know it's older than me because someone older than them told it to someone older. He said he was sitting at a restaurant, and there was a couple, and they were kind of gossiping about a little old lady and a little old fellow that were further down than the restaurant. He said, they must be having an argument. I said, why is that? He says, they haven't said a word this whole time they're sitting together, and all we've been doing is talking. They must not be happy. And then as they exit the restaurant, he sees them holding hands under the table, just holding hands through the whole conversation. And the young guy and the young lady are like, well, boy, we didn't know. <laughs> we didn't know. They didn't have anything that they needed to say, but they were happy to be there together. What an interesting conversation that we could say ourselves. Sometimes our judgments are clouded. Sometimes our words are hurtful. Sometimes our words aren't useful. Sometimes our opinions don't matter. Sometimes God hasn't revealed uh, what He wants us to know, and we just go beyond it. Sometimes silence would just be best. Sometimes we're told, hey, don't speak. And sometimes we just talk, talk, talk when there's no uh, reason for it. But you know what we can do? We can study the will of the Lord enough to know that we can know what God wants us to say. We can know with full assurance the things He wants us to say. And so when we're gathered together at times like these and we listen to lessons like these, don't come away with it drawing negativity. Come away with it figuring, well, what shall I do with my speech? How shall I speak in the world in which we live in? The answer is in the gospel. Over and over, the story of Jesus gives illustrations, gives parables, gives instances of what He did in His own life, gives stories of the Old Testament times re repeated in the New Testament times to help us understand. Uh, the Old Testament has been preserved with lots of information to help us. And a lot of times what we need to do is just go back to the Bible, look for our help in what to say, and we'll be filled with enough knowledge to know what to say at what given time. But sometimes, it's just best to be silent. There are some times we don't need to give a long speech. We don't need to give a, a lot of talk. We just need to be there for one another. Just need to smile, be there, be respectful of one another, and the things in which we all undergo from day to day. These are important lessons. These are lessons that are not fluffy because we all fall victim to one of these categories, if not all eight from time to time. And so as we look at this, let's let our speech be with grace, seasoned with salt, so that we know how to answer each one. But in our answering of one another, let us do so with a frame of mind that seeks to teach Jesus in what we teach and to live in such a way that when people see us, they don't see us. They see Jesus, and they're thirsty for more. They want to hear more of the will of the Lord. They hear us and they think, that person's kind of different. They're filled with some sort of speech that doesn't sound like anybody else in the community, doesn't really sound like any of my friends or my relatives. They sound different. It's like the old statement, I think it was Leo Tolstoy or Ernest Hemingway or some famous author who said, if you really want to find someone that has some sort of unique perspective on life or has some sort of deep wit that is more introspective and noble than anything else, ask them what books they read. If you honestly said, I read a divine library that's not from man but from heaven, that would show why people would be thirsty for Jesus. They'll hear the words of Jesus in our speech. They'll hear the words of Jesus in the things that we do and say. And we can be the people that when people ask us of things, we can have an answer. That's why in 1 Peter he says, be ready to give an answer or a defense for the reason for the hope that is within you. And so the hope that is within us is the hope of heaven. 
the hope of Christ the righteous coming back one day in the skies to bring all the righteous to heaven and, and to bring the saved with Him to His home in glory. And we want that for you too tonight. Maybe you're here tonight and you're thinking, I'm not a Christian yet. I, I, I haven't been baptized for the forgiveness of my sins. Well, if that's your case, we have the ability to baptize you tonight. And if you want to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, 1 Peter 3.21 says there is an antitype which now saves you, baptism. And so if you wish to be saved, we can do that. But perhaps you're someone here tonight who maybe you've been baptized, but maybe uh, you've fallen away from the Lord or uh, went back into worldliness or done or said some things maybe you shouldn't have said or done. If that's the case, God says you can be forgiven of your sins. You can be forgiven and you can be restored to the faith. If we can help you come back to the Lord and, and serve Him as best you can, or if we can help you become a Christian through repentance and baptism, please come forward as we stand and sing our invitation song.